Welcome to the latest episode of the Digital Adoption Show, where we delve into the intricacies of personalized learning. Today, we have a panel of experts exploring how to tailor learning experiences to individual employee goals while aligning them with organizational objectives. We also discuss the pivotal role of technology, how to identify real-time learning opportunities and strategies for translating these insights into actionable improvements. Tune in for an insightful discussion that covers every angle of personalized learning. In the first segment, we asked Carrie Burke, Vice President of Learning and Development at Teladoc Health, and Jessica Michaels, Neurodiversity Leadership Coach, Consultant, and Speaker at the Neurodiverse Workplace, how they ensure that personalized learning experiences not only cater to individual employee goals, but are also seamlessly aligned with organizational objectives. Sure. I mean, I think the first thing you need to do is understand employee strengths and weaknesses and, you know, L&D teams need to find ways to help employees figure that out and coach managers to help their employees to figure that out. So what am I good at? Where are my opportunities to get stronger? What do I like? What do I not like? And where do I aspire to be? And, and I think actually very few employees really know it clearly. I mean, I even think yeah, as a Gen Xer, I'm still not sure what I want to be when I grow up sometimes. And so I think it's a challenge, but I think if you know, we, we all generally have an idea of what we like and what we don't like and where our strengths and weaknesses are. And then I think understanding the organization you're working for, where are they going? What are they doing? Common themes right now is all about technology. It's all about AI. It's all about rapid growth for the most part. So what do I bring to the table that connects to that? And more often than not, it's going to connect to the goals of the organization. And so I think it's just really spending time reflecting and understanding who you are and having some idea of the road that you want to go on. And the road could be super twisty and, and, and need to be repaved, or it could be a lot smoother and straighter. But, but once you kind of get that figured out, I think the journey makes a lot more sense and it's easier to connect it to the organization's goals. Absolutely. I think it helps for the organization to have a strong sense of what the goals and the mission are. Because in L&D, even if we're talking about something that isn't directly related to those goals or that mission, we can use the vocabulary of the organization to just make concepts familiar to the employees so it normalizes you know the the ethos that the company wants to have so we really do have ways that we can drive that in every everything that we create and everything that we do but it really helps if employees are getting the message not just when they go to something from L&D but every time they see something or hear something, those things are related back to those themes that the organization finds important. I also think it's important that organizations, you know, have a good idea in the talent management space of what is our philosophy? What does a good manager look like here? What does a good employee look like here? And, you know, so Things like, you know, leveling and career progressions, just as Carrie said, those things should all tie together. It shouldn't be, I need to act one way if I want to get promoted. I need to act another way if I want to, you know, join a high profile project. These should all weave together. But L&D does have a very unique, a unique point in all of that and unique ability to be able to just give voice to those and really make those and make those corporate initiatives and goals, make them real for employees in a learning and development setting. Later in the discussion, we posed another question to both Carrie and Jessica. How important is it to keep up with new technologies while creating personalized learning modules? And do they have any real life examples to share? Here's what they had to say. Yeah, I think keeping up with technology is, is tough just because it's constantly changing. And I feel like I learned some new random shortcut for my iPhone and feel really dumb that I didn't know this beforehand. And even using Excel or Teams, there's a constant whole set you have to be 
staying on, on top of. And I think what I find is there's two kind of things that I, I like to focus on is personalization and then what drives efficiency. So personalization is like, how much can I customize Microsoft Teams or even my Outlook to work more efficiently for me, whether it's getting rid of junk and prioritizing messages to respond to and, you know, things like that. I think one of the things that we've tried to do internally is drive more effective meetings, which seems like such a basic thing, but from a technology perspective, it's like managing the calendar. So your meetings are 25 minutes, not 30 minutes. It's, you know, sending out agendas beforehand and, and using auto-generated tools to do that. It's using tools that help you take notes in a meeting through the transcripts and help kind of curate that on the back end so you can go back and kind of reflect on what you've discussed. So I think that's probably kind of a, is something unique that the company's adopted that I think has been very, very helpful. And then I think the other thing is we're trying to figure out, which I think a lot of companies are, is how does AI fit into all of this? And, and what are the rules around AI and what are the swim lanes and how does it help us and not hurt us? And how do we leverage it in the best way possible? I think it's still a question mark. No doubt it's great and it's going to transform how we do things, but I still don't think it's going to replace people and it isn't going to replace brain power and certainly not going to replace personality. So how do we break that in effectively? I think that rather than trying to keep up with every new piece of technology, the, the opportunity that technology offers us in a learning and development space is the benefit of multimodal learning. It used to be that if you wanted somebody to learn something, you got everybody in a room, you know, there was coffee and lemonade in the back with some stale croissants and, and things for people. And you went through and you did a live training session. And for some people, that space is a great way for them to learn. For other people, they're just watching the clock, trying to get through the day and they're not taking in any of the things you want them to learn. It also removes people from their element. The place where they're going to be using the knowledge is at their desk. So if you take them away into a totally different space, uh, it's not as conducive to knowledge transfer as if somebody is able to take in new information in the space that they're going to be using it every day. Technology allows us to say, okay, some people learn best in that live setting. Let's do that. Absolutely. But rather than depending on just an attendance sheet of who came to the live training and saying, oh, learning has taken place, we're able to meet people where their brains work best, whether it's best, for example, that they're able to listen to while they're bicycling, or if it's and e-learning, you know, an interactive e-learning where they're able to go through and actually work the information with their hands a little bit. And all of those things are equal. That's, I think, the thing that um, I'm looking for in the next technology that I really love and, and evangelize is something that will take the live training, the podcasts, you know, the people who download um, you know, download a, a, a white paper, you know, or a job tool and takes all of that and says, okay, these people have all completed whatever we needed them to complete. And all of these forms are good enough by either testing or by just, you know, some way of analyzing that the information has actually transferred. And then in three months, six months, nine months, measuring his behavior change taken place and how can we support that behavior change? So technology really can be useful in supporting what we know about the way different brains work and about the way people uh, learn information. If we get out of our own way and get rid of some of our own biases about the way training needs to be done or what constitutes a training and focusing on do our people know what we want them to know? And are they able to use that to progress and perform? In this next segment, we had two distinguished speakers, Fran Harrison, learning technology strategist at QA Limited, and Andrew Jacobs, CEO of L-Learn Learning Services. 
sharing insights on how to identify real-time learning opportunities with an employee's daily task. Keep listening as they have some amazing things to say. I think for me, the most important way in is to take as many ways in as possible. So whenever I've just been told to, or sort of brought in to develop something, the first thing I do is consult. I don't say, what do we need to learn? What are we trying to achieve? I say, what's the problem? Yeah. What does it look like now? Why is that a problem for you? Mm-hmm. And what should the solution look like? And not even talk about what needs to happen to get there until we've really thrashed out exactly what is happening now and what needs to happen in the future. And particularly if we're introducing new change, which I did quite a lot when I was working in, in schools doing advisory, I was rolling out a platform across 280 schools. Mm-hmm. And the first thing I did was sit and chat to them about life and what was happening. I'd sit with the senior management team, unpick what their problems were, because I didn't want to hand them a platform. I wanted to solve their problems. And I think it's so important not just to go in and say, right, let's roll this out. What are we going to do? We can use this. We can use that. We can use that piece of technology. Yes, we can. But let's make sure we're solving problems for people first. Andrew, I don't know what you think about that. I think one of the problems is, is there's, a, there's a disconnect between the learning function and the workplace. And I get really frustrated. I keep hearing about how learning should be aligned with the business. And that's not good enough. Because if you're aligned with the business, you are parallel to you're not part of learning should be integrated within the business. And that requires a, a change of thought from the learning function. And what we do is we focus on the way we supply stuff and things, whatever the stuff and things are, rather than on the performance piece. And that takes a a mindset shift to think about performance as the ultimate goal from learning and development. And we're not there yet. Yeah, and I've always said that. No matter what change you're introducing, whether it's technological change, whether it's business change, Mm -hmm. what you're actually introducing is people change. Yeah. All the others, all the rest is just stuff. What you what needs to move, what you need to bring with you, the people, the thing you need to engage with the people, no matter what it is. Mm-hmm. And I think, yes, it's if you start with the people and you start with where you are and where you're trying to go, what data you're trying to capture, you're a long way there already, rather than going, right, let's do this. Yeah. And pushing. They, and yeah. pushing is another problem, is just it's so easy to design something and put it out to learners and then walk away take a happy sheet at the end everybody says they were happy with it whereas actually we need to challenge learners make them feel a bit uncomfortable but we don't actually need to necessarily produce learning it might not be a learning problem it's making sure you've got that problem and you've got that solution in mind so you you completely jumped into my pond (laughs) (laughs) So let let me get on my high horse. So my high horse, my high horse is two horses I'm climbing on here. So the first one is to do with um, capability. And we fundamentally get this wrong in learning development. So we want people to be capable to do their job. Capability requires two parts. It requires the the cape part, which is capacity and Mm -hmm. ability. Learning development, we are so focused on ability that we ignore the capacity. And the capacity yeah. will be the aims, the objectives, the structure, the relationships, the systems, the processes, technologies, and the culture that exists in the space where people work. And you can give people all the ability you want, but if they don't have the space to perform, we're mm-hmm. going to get it wrong. Yeah, that's okay. I'll get off of that high horse and get onto the other high horse. <laughs> and the other high horse is the data, which you mentioned as well, Fran. We don't understand how to use data properly in learning development. Mm-hmm. We assume that bums on seats, as Donald Clark says, if you're counting bums on seats, you're counting the wrong end of the person. We assume bums on seats equals engagement. We assume clicks mm-hmm. equals engagement. It's meaningless metrics, vanity metrics used by learning functions to justify they've done something. Like yeah. I said before, a thing or a, you know, some stuff, whatever the thing happens to be. And we need to understand data better. And that is part of the gap that exists within performance. How can I say, oh, I'm improving performance if I'm not measuring an improvement in performance? Yeah, It's really important to define that improvement as well, isn't it? I think you can, I've seen it happen where you go from from saying, were you happy, were the biscuits okay? And really that very shallow data too far the other direction where you're measuring maybe 13, 14, 15 different things and it then becomes too diluted. What are your focuses and what, what do you actually need 
what's the most important thing? Focus on three, four or five different things. Mm. And then it's far easier to demonstrate change. And it might not be something you've done. It might be something happening informally that you've just facilitated. And that's OK, too. You don't have to produce something to affect change. It's the the age old argument about the effectiveness of a course. You know, two people go along on a course and uh, they have a chat at the tea break and one person says something fundamental and absolutely crystallizes something for the other person. The other person goes back to work and performs brilliantly as a result of that conversation they've had. And the course gets the credit for it. But it wasn't the course that provided it. It was just the happenstance of those two people being in the same place at the same time. And that's what we don't understand in learning. We don't think, well, how do we measure those kind of impacts and uh, collisions where people come together to understand the benefit that they uh, supply and provide people? Finally, when we asked about how do they translate these insights into actionable improvements and what strategies they use to address skill gaps, here's what Fran and Andrew had to say. So I'll start on this one. So, so I apply something and I, I suggest people apply uh, something to how they're approaching their learning. And that's the three A's. Mm -hmm. So we want to identify why does someone need to know something? And they need to know it for one of three A's. The first A is about awareness. They mm -hmm. know something, but they've forgotten it. Yeah. And a lot of what we do in learning development is just about raising awareness. So you used to do that thing, let's show you you know how it's done again we'll raise awareness of it and a lot of lnd could be met through just doing awareness mm -hmm. and that's at the point of need in the the chain of work oh how do i do this click plays me a gif that shows me how to do the thing done there we go the second day which we fall into in learning development too much is acquisition mm -hmm. we assume people want to know everything yeah. and the example i use about this is crossing the road if I'm mm -hmm. going to cross the road um, and I can see a BMW uh, 7 Series coming down the road, I don't need to know how the braking system in a BMW 7 Series works. Yeah. But in learning development, we build e-learning modules that teach people how to cross the road. And by the way, this is the braking system of a BMW 7 Series because you might need to know that. Mm -hmm. And we over oversupply stuff that we think people might need to know. Mm -hmm. Most people don't need that. Most people need the third A, which mm -hmm. is application, the opportunity to practice and try things out in the workplace mm -hmm. in a safe way, which is tied in with that capacity piece. So giving people space to do mm -hmm. things and learn things and apply the things they've already learned, their knowledge and their understanding and their awareness mm -hmm. into doing the job. I think that's probably what we call just enough and just in time. <laughs> and it's so hard to get it the balance exactly right but i mean it, it's a sliding scale but yes yeah, don't deliver the training on something you're going to do in six months time in full and then leave it yeah. deliver it nearer the time maybe do drip feed and do reminders and it's that constant application to to make sure it's sticky learning it sticks around the the favorite example is managing sickness absence every organization does managing sickness absence training all the managers are trained in how to manage sickness absence. Um, but it doesn't make any difference to sickness absence in organisations because the sickness absence stays exactly as it is. What we can, could and should be doing is going, well, which functions need more help? How do we give them the help that they need? Exactly. Do managers need to practice dealing with um, you know, particular issues? Is there a particular sector that's having a particular problem within our organisation? And spend time focusing on the data behind it to then decide, is it awareness, just raising people's awareness? Is it because they don't know acquisition or do they just need a chance to practice, which is application? Mm. I think I'd probably add to that as well. Is it a people problem? Mm, uh, which is exactly my capacity point yeah. yeah is it people or is it the system's bad yeah yeah system's bad there may be some processes in place that are just dis disengaging people so they feel they need time out sometimes it what back to that thing of what is the problem and i always i love is it sakichi toyoda who used five whys and how hmm. I am the eternal three-year-old who will ask why time and time again because it's until you start getting back to the how, you have to ask why. Why is this a problem? Why do you need to address it? And just keep drilling back until you find out what the problem is. And until you've got the absolute core problem, it's really hard to know that you've got the right solution. But this is where the mind shift, 
the mindset shift has to happen. Yeah. Because if you're asking why and all you're doing coming back to is training, learning, and so on, then you're not asking the right the right the why questions. Mm -hmm. Because it won't just be about training and learning. Mm -hmm. It will be about systems and structures and personnel and people and relationships and so on. This was indeed a fantastic discussion. The panel and their insights on personalized learning, technology integration, and much more were incredibly enlightening. To our listeners, we encourage you to explore these thought-provoking conversations on the Digital Adoption Show across all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple, Google, and YouTube. Whether you are at home or on the go, our podcast is your gateway to the latest trends in learning and development. I'm your host, Neha Smriti, signing off. Stay tuned for more engaging and informative episodes. Thank you. Thank you.